All right, excellent. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Zabata. I'm, the, I'm a proud JBO alumna and director of alumni relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for today's session, Pivoting During COVID-19, How JWU Alumni in the Hospitality Industry Adjusted. We're excited to bring this program to you and look forward to this interesting discussion related to the experiences and stories of a few of our alumni. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. If you have a question for the panelists, please add it to the Q&A section. These questions will be asked of the panel throughout the program. We will get to as many as time allows. The chat feature can be used to message other attendees privately or publicly. This section is lo also located at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes of today's session, especially Liza Gentile, Assistant Director of Alumni, Re alumni Relations, and Jay Wu alumna for her work to bring this program to us. So thank you. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. James Griffin, proud JWU alum from the classes of 1988 and 1992 and professor within the College of Hospitality Management. Dr. Griffin is a professor in the Food and Beverage Management Department at Johnson & Wales University. From 2012 to, 2020, to 2014, he served as president and CEO of the Cool Fish Division of Slade, Gorton & Company. Prior to joining Slade Gorton, Griffin spent more than two decades with Johnson & Wales University serving in several senior roles, including Associate Provost of the University and Vice President and Dean of Academic Affairs of JWU's Denver campus. In addition to his work in higher education, Griffin has served as a consultant and owner of several food service related businesses. Griffin teaches undergraduate courses in management, human resources and strategy. He earned a doctorate degree at Boston University and holds graduate and undergraduate degrees from Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for leading today's discussion, Dr. Griffin, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori, and it's truly an honor to be your host today as both the JNW faculty member and a graduate and a guy who's still trying to perfect how to dice an onion. Uh, the uh, title of today's program is Pivoting During COVID-19, How JNW Alumni in the Hospitality Industry Adapted, but the essence of the program is a series of life lessons that uh, were learned and are going to be shared by six graduates of Johnson & Wales over these past months. Uh, Johnson & Wales has been helping students build the lives they dream of for more than 100 years. And you know, as well as I do as alumni, that uh, each of our lives has been improved or even defined um, by our time at JWU. And 30 years hence, I certainly know that my, my own uh, success in life has been defined by my time spent as a young kid at Johnson & Wales. Um, and so today, I hope that you'll hear stories and a narrative from each of our speakers about what is really the essence of that experience of hard work and dedication and character and flexibility. The last three months have been an incredible time for us. Um, and so our goal today is to share the stories of how these folks have pivoted. So I hope you enjoy these incredible stories you're about to hear. Um, you know, today we'll spend, uh, today we'll follow a three-step process. We're going to start with uh, having each of our six panelists introduce themselves. Next, we'll hit the middle of our presentation, which is two to three questions that we hope will elicit some of that storytelling and lesson sharing. And then we're going to wrap things up with some open uh, question time. And total should take us uh, about till quarter after one. I'm just checking the clock here. We start a little bit late, but we'll, we'll stay on schedule. Um, so it really is a privilege to open up. Uh, we have uh, six speakers joining us. And I'm just going to pull over my notes here. We're going to work in order from top to bottom, starting with John Searock, uh, class of 95, president of John Searock Catering. Next, we're going to hear uh, from Christopher Viad up at the Greenleaf Restaurant in Milford, New Hampshire, um, class of 2012. Interesting story of where Christopher was at when this uh, crisis hit. Uh, then we're going to shift to Eric Hagen down in New York City, which we know is uh, early on in this process was a major center and subsequently has really helped resolve itself. He's chief operating officer for Zakarian Restaurants and works with Jeffrey Zakarian. Um, then we're going to hear from Mike Levine, a really incredible entrepreneur, class of 2012, Global Food Solutions. Another fo uh, person in the New York metro area, Mike's going to share his story, uh, interesting story about he pivoted. We're going to jump in with uh, Heather Singleton, class of 97, who shares an incredible story of advocacy with the Rhode Island Hospitality Association. 
they achieved some things that lead, led the way nationally and helped restaurants recover. I'll let her tell that story. And then we're going to come through and meet up with Derek Wagner. Um, Derek, as you know, is the owner of Nixon Broadway here, multiple James Beard nominee, uh, honorary degree recipient of Johnson & Wales, and De Derek's going to share his unique and interesting story, all of which are life lessons and I think teach us how to pivot. So let's begin with opening up to each of our uh, alumni speakers and let's, uh, let's turn it over to John Searock to share with us what's happening down in his neck of the woods in Pennsylvania. Over to you, John. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, as, as Jim mentioned, I'm John Sirock. I'm the owner of Sirock Catering, Westchester, PA. For the past 20 years, I've been a full-service, off-premise caterer, uh, specializing in weddings, but more importantly, specializing in large group gatherings. Um, when your entire business model is based on large group gatherings, and the CDC comes out at the beginning of, you know, what was to be the first week of our, you know, next 40 weeks of 40 week busy season and tells you to stop all gatherings for groups over 10, uh, pretty, pretty devastating. Not really sure what that next step was going to be. You know, at the time, our menu, our smallest, uh, you know, menu package was based on 10 people. So we had to quickly kind of figure out what we were going to do. I, I didn't want to lay staff off. I didn't want to stop operations for what that point I thought was gonna be about two or three weeks. So we made a decision to work with our community and we put together a uh, what we call Westchester Care Share Meal Program, where we sold some of those packages that were based on feeding 10 people, kind of scaled them down. And in turn, we shared a meal uh, with families in need through our school district. And, uh, you know, it was really important to try and keep some of our staff working. I had some staff going through recovery and, you know, people that needed this job and I wanted to make sure I could keep an eye on them as well. And I didn't want to just let them get lost to the unemployment system where our focus went with. Thank you. So you took a direct in a, almost a direct hit when, when this happened. Um, flatlined. Flatlined. So we're going to loop back with you and we start a Q and A and in the interim, thank you. Uh, we're going to pivot over John to uh, Chris up in New Hampshire. Uh, so why don't we slip over to Chris and he can tell his story about Greenleaf and some of the trajectory that you've experienced, Chris. Yes, thank you, Jim. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> As Jim had mentioned, my name is Chris Vio. I'm a graduate of Johnson & Wales in Providence. Uh, I graduated in 2012 which, with my bachelor's in food service management. And I now um, am the chef and owner of Northern Comfort Hospitality, which owns uh, three different uh, dining groups, which is Culture, Bread and Sandwich, uh, which was slated to open back in April. Uh, Greenleaf, which is our flagship um, upscale casual farm to table dining establishment and the farmers dinner, which is a um, catering company that hosts dinners on open fields and farms uh, for 50 to 150 guests uh, with no running water or electricity. So that's an interesting project. And um, this kind of took us all by storm. And it was it was very shocking to see all the transition that was happening throughout the whole course of um, the news arising about COVID-19 and making those difficult decisions of whether or not we should remain open or close our doors and how we would go about taking care of our staff because they rely on us so heavily for their livelihoods, for taking care of their family, prov providing meals. And it was just very tough to see that what we were going through and knowing that there was no real end in sight and not really understanding the whole aspect of what was actually happening. Um, so we received the calls and the state mandated issues about going switching over to takeout, uh, which was very tough for us because again, we are an upscale uh, dining establishment focusing on farm to table cuisine and we are heavily um, regarded for our plating presentation. So we pretty much had to open up a whole new restaurant for catering towards takeout, which was just like uh, shifting towards larger family formats and comfort food. Um, so it was, it was a very difficult decision to make because again, we were just hitting our one year mark and not knowing if we were going to succeed after this, going through this whole project and spending all this money on this new equipment to come in to be able to cater to take out and then having to think about the next phase about reopening outside and what equipment and money that we have to spend for out there to make sure that this business is sustainable and can work. And laying off our staff or furloughing them was very, very tough on, on, on all of us. I mean, we kept in close contact and we made sure to keep them in the loop of anything, any news that was coming towards us so that we can transfer over to them, but again, uh, no one was really sure what was going to happen next, so we just played it by ear. And once we were getting throughout the next phases and we saw that the takeout was picking back up, I was able to bring back some more of the employees, which was great. And then uh, we got this opportunity to present 1,200 sandwiches to the frontline workers, 
which was uh, a huge opportunity for us to kind of explain to the community that we're still up and running and we're doing the best that we can to offer some food for uh, the community around that's doing their best to keep us all safe. Um, so we're just still stuck in the middle of this, figuring everything out as we go along and we're looking forward to the next phase as always. So, so and I, I was, it was great that we had our first meeting and you were actually in the restaurant the day it was reopening. <laughs> right. So we appreciate that. But, but you, you mentioned very quickly, you were opening a, a new unit in April. Is that correct? And then this, correct. this was right in the middle of it. Well, yeah, so we were holding on to that space uh, since back in November, and we wanted to open December, then it came January, then we were like, all right, let's just get through all the holidays first, and then we were go going guns blazing in March, and then April came, and we were supposed to open April 24th, and of course, mid-March was when all the, all the closures happened, so it's just now, three months after, that we're like, all right, we have this space, we need to kind of do something about it, and uh, kind of move forward. So, uh, perfect, perfect response to our theme today, thank you. Uh, Chris, and uh, we'll come back around and you can share some of the more of the detail. Um, and now we'll shift down to New York City uh, and we'll shift over to Eric with uh, the Chief Operating Officer for Zakarian uh, Hospitality and the restaurants that, uh, that uh, Chef Jeffrey uh, operates. And let's hear from you, Eric, and where you're at uh, today and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, th thanks for having me, and uh, nice to see you, Derek, too, um, as always. Uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, I, I work with, uh, with Jeffrey Zakari here in New York City. Um, we, I live in Manhattan. Uh, my story is particularly unique, I think, because I got married actually on March 7th. Um, my wife is actually a doctor, um, so we were on our honeymoon in Columbia, and we obviously had a lot of anxiety knowing what we were both coming back to in terms of our work lives and our personal lives. Um, I graduated in 07. Uh, I was lucky enough to return to Rhode Island to open the Ocean House. Um, I've been working with Jeffrey for going on nine years um, in a number of roles as a, as a chef, as a director of culinary, um, to his CEO of restaurants. Um, you know, for us, the pandemic is a, is really a, a center, you know, it's a severe health issue. At one point, it was and I should say it kind of remains today where, you know, you, you need to wear gloves and a mask to really go down the elevator in your building. Um, you know, at one time we were kind of looking at Wuhan and, and saying, you know, we would hate to be in that situation. And, you know, we kind of came back to that very quickly. Um, you know, it was, it was very difficult, obviously, you know, without going too far into it in terms of the number of staff that you had to communicate, um, you know, their situation with their jobs. Um, you know, we continue to do our best to stay up to date with how the government is shifting and, and the regulations that, um, in terms of how they're, how they're handling the PPP and, and how we communicate that to our staff and, and, and when we can bring them back on and when the best time to do that is. Um, but, but during this time, we've really shifted. We have other areas in our business with, with products with QVC and, um, you know, we have an upcoming project in Doha that we're working on and, you know, even our television stuff that we have, our, you know, we've shifted from doing stuff in the studio at, you know, Food Network to doing it in apartments and homes, which is certainly different. Um, but, you know, we, a lot of our restaurants are operating in hotels. So we have a lot of hotel partners. So it's been a lot of communicating with them in terms of how they foresee, uh, you know, their occupancy changing and, and, you know, how we can best work with them to, to open up. So, um it's certainly been a experience being here in New York City the last uh, few months. Um, but the, the big thing for us has been really trying to keep in touch with our staff. Um, you know, I think when the pandemic hit, we had something around 400 individuals working in our restaurants. So um, that, that keeps you up at night when you, when you think about that impact. And, and, you know, for us, it's been how can we support those individuals and make sure that um, we, we can do everything that we can to make sure that they have what they need. So it's great to be here and I'm, I hope everybody's staying safe and doing well wherever they are. Yeah, so thank you. Amazing story. And uh, you know, the, the, the epicenter of some of the issue we face now is shifted out of New York, but I can only imagine some of what you'll share, what it was like uh, during the heat of the moment with New York uh, at its uh, toughest moments in the end of April and into May. Um, we were certainly all watching for you guys in the city, although, uh, we were struggling here in Rhode Island and up in Massachusetts too. 
everywhere, sure. Everywhere. Um, and then uh, we also, with the New York Metro region, have Mike Levine, um, entrepreneur and president of his own business. So Mike, why don't you give us some insight on your end? I know you were in a different sector um, and working in uh, sort of a different area of hospitality. So let's hear from Mike. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, thanks so much for having me today. So uh, our company, Global Food Solutions, we're primarily based uh, to do food service channels, uh, restaurants, you know, guys like Cisco, Yost Foods. Um, but core for us is the K through 12, um, you know, food service program across America. We work with clients like New York City Public Schools, LA, Seattle, um, anything to Dallas, we're in about 40 states, um, reaching tens of millions of students on a, on a weekly basis. Um, so for us, it was, you know, a really interesting, um, you know, kind of time. It's the first time we've ever seen you know, mass school closures or, or anything even close to this. Um, and we really found ourselves in, in kind of a position of, you know, on one half of our business, we had to drastically scale down products and operations and things we were doing for a short period of time uh, because programs weren't utilizing, you know, hot breakfast products and different things of that nature. Um, while at the same time, we, we had offered in the past years, uh, you know, a variety of meal kits and emergency relief type products as we've done work with you know, FEMA, the US military, um, we've done a lot of things when the kind of hurricanes hit in Puerto Rico. Um, but what I think made this situation so unique is, you know, like we shared with our team internally, the supply chain was ready for you know, a hurricane. It's ready for those kind of situations. But the situation that you know, has really hit the entire economy, but specifically the hospitality and you know, restaurant and food sector very, very hard was, it's like everybody needed everything that would happen in a hurricane or, or that kind of situation, but everybody needed it in every single city everywhere in America, you know, and then additionally outside of America as well. Um, so, you know, dealing with our employees, dealing with our 28 different production facilities that we contract, you know, our different pr programs out of, um, you know, getting that structured, but also at the same time scaling up, you know, meal kit operations where we used to do, you know, you know, maybe a couple hundred, couple thousand a day um, to be able to produce millions of meal kits, you know, per week. Um, and what that looks like through the supply chain between, you know, trying to hire, you know, dozens and dozens of people and open new facilities. And, you know, through the pandemic, we brought on some 15 new suppliers, opened three production facilities, hired, you know, about 150 or so people. Um, so we found ourselves in kind of a really unique position of, you know, yeah, we definitely got crushed like everybody else on a lot of our stuff. Um, but, but I think by being able to work really close with our network and suppliers, um, we were able to come up with some really amazing solutions um, to be able to create, you know, millions of emergency relief meals that have gone everywhere from, you know, school programs all over the country, New York or in LA, Dallas, all the way to uh, hospitals. We did work with the Javits Center Hospital that was built and things in Central Park. So, it got really chaotic in there. And, uh, you know, for us, we're, we're fortunate that we're able to, to shift a little bit um, to most importantly, help meet the demand and, and create things uh, so that people in this country, quite honestly, weren't, weren't going hungry. It sounds to me like you, you've downplayed the shift, but it was actually quite epic <laughs> when you talk about the uh, level. So we'll hear more about that. Um, and fascinating to hear about how doors opened and you've hired at a time when uh, so many folks, I think, were cutting. So we want to we want to scratch into that a little bit. So thank you, thank you, Mike. And um, now back to home, we have the two, next two speakers are are right here local. And uh, you know, so let's hear from Heather Singleton with the Rhode Island Hospitality Association. Um, very very interesting perspective as we get into the associations we're part of an advocacy. Some have done better than others, but I tell you the Rhode Island Hospitality Association has done some incredible work and we're excited to hear from Heather today as an alum from uh, back in uh, 97 and 1999 with her MBA. So Heather. Um, th thank you, Dr. Griffin. Um, and hello to all of my you know, fellow alumna on the call. Mm -hmm. What's up, Derek? I haven't seen you in a while, so I'm, I'm glad to see your face here. Um, so the Rhode Island Hospitality Association, uh, we're a trade organization. We represent food service, lodging, and the tourism sector here in Rhode Island. Um, 
we're a membership organization. We have about 800 companies locally that belong to our group. Um, but overall, our mission is to advocate on behalf of the hospitality industry. And most of that advocacy work that we do is at the state level, whether it's um, when the General Assembly is in session and they're going through their legislative process each year, their budgeting process. Um, but it's also throughout the entire year working with a number of different regulators, whether it's the Department of Health, the Department of Business Regulation, the Department of Labor and Training, et cetera. Um, we typically don't get involved in local city or town uh, issues because we're a statewide organization. We would be probably spending, you know, the majority of our time on all 39 cities and towns, but we will get involved if it's um, an issue that could have a significant impact and kind of roll over into neighboring uh, cities or towns. Um, and then at the federal level, we are the state partner to the National Restaurant Association and the American Hotel and Lodging Association. So we've got some federal level um, advocacy on that part. We also have um, someone on our board of directors here in, in Rhode Island. His name is Brian Casey, and he owns um, the Oak Hill Tavern down in North Kingstown. He's actually the vice chairman of the National Restaurant Association, and he will become chairman of uh, chairman next year. So we're pretty excited. We've got a local Rhode Island, uh, you know, restaurant owner with, that's doing a fantastic job for us nationally. Um, I think that, you know, when I'm reflecting on what has happened with, with our industry, especially here locally, you know, I was just kind of looking at some dates just to figure out kind of a timeline here of what we're looking at. And in Rhode Island, um, you know, March 16th was the official date that our governor announced um, a shutdown of restaurants. Hotels were never shut down in the state, um, although obviously they lost a significant amount of business with uh, the meetings and conventions and large groups, especially in the Providence area. Um, so that's just a, a point of notation that they were never formally shut down. It's just that there was, you know, no rooms being sold. Um, but we, you know, around here, looking at the numbers, and so far in um, 2020, we have not been operating at full capacity for 146 days. Um, and we're slowly starting to, you know, what, like many other states that you hear the phases, the phase one, the phase two, the phase three, our major role has been to con continuously educate the folks that are making the decisions on and who is advising the governor on how to move forward throughout this phase in process. And that is a number of different state departments. The first one we worked with was the Department of Labor and Training to get our employees eligible for unemployment insurance, but then it's Department of Health and Commerce that's really driving the bus on coming up with these regulations. So. Um, that's where we've been spending the majority of our time is educating those folks that are making decisions on our behalf and telling us how, well, telling all of you as business owners, how you're supposed to operate in this new world. Um, the majority of them have never owned a hospitality business. So we're speaking on behalf of those owners um, and that's where we've been spending most of our time. And, and you know the, the great work you've done uh, as as should be the case. And I hope at some point you'll touch on a little bit on the story as the chief operating officer, how you help with the regulatory shift when it comes to takeout alcohol, because you were one of the first, I think, in the U.S. amongst the first to actually achieve that. And if we open up the dialogue, you'll hear that some of what you did with the alcohol, in particular, and takeout, was very helpful to some of our restaurant community members. So. So we hope to hear a little bit more about that. And one of those community members is Derek Wagner, who's joining us, um, entrepreneur and graduate, um, and uh, the owner and operator, and chef owner and operator of Mix on Broadway here in Providence. So why don't we shift over to Derek? Hi, Jim. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, Eric, congratulations on your, on your wedding. I know we haven't spoken, just a little bit of messaging here and there, but 
what a crazy time to get married. Uh, God bless you. And uh, everybody on the call um, for sharing your story and, uh, and gathering around the campfire, the Zoom campfire, so to speak. Um, these calls, although they're, you know, one extra uh, step to take when you're trying to bail out the boat um, in these critical moments. Uh, they've been really uh, technically, spiritually, uh, um, just so helpful. Um, all these different groups and different um, uh, chances and opportunities we've had to come together as a community, even um, using our resources that, you know, virtually now, um, it's just been very, very helpful, I know, to our industry, uh, to, to our communities, uh, to me personally, professionally. So uh, thanks again for this opportunity to just get together and uh, hear and um, commiserate and learn um, uh, from everybody. Um, so as uh, Jim mentioned, um, you know, I graduated uh, in uh, 97 with my uh, associates in culinary, 99 with uh, food marketing, um, and then um, got the was really uh, honored to get the uh, honorary doctorate last year, uh, 20 years 20 years later, um, and I am the uh, owner operator of Nixon Broadway and formerly uh, Nixon Westminster, which we can talk about more later. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been open for, I opened in 2000 and um, 2001, I signed the lease, 2002, we opened the doors in February. Uh, so we're going, uh, we're into our 18, um, 18 year anniversary was in February. Uh, and now we're in our, going into our 19th year. So um, we've grown, evolved a lot over the years. Um, we've seen uh, a few, a few, um, incredibly impactful events happen over the last almost 20 years, but nothing, nothing quite like this. Um, and uh, to the point uh, where, you know, we on so many levels, uh, everyone here is a great cross section of, of the industry, uh, but as owner operator, uh, small business, two small businesses, um, employer of about at, at the time uh, when uh, March 16th hit, uh, we were in the mid fifties in terms of uh, employee numbers um, and uh, still within the first year. So I have one restaurant going on almost two decades and then the other restaurant within its first year of, of opening. Um, so uh, that in itself, very, very challenging for such a, like a very hands-on um, manager and, and, um, similar to what Christopher was saying about their style of, of food, uh, sort of casual, upscale, uh, very farm to table focused, um, very community focused, um, presentation focused, um, three meals a day in both spots. Um, and when this hit and sort of to preface, uh, I think maybe to segue into the next piece, um, you know, the official call date in, was in Rhode Island was March 16th, uh, but we started to see uh, consumer behavior, um, industry impact was happening in February for, for sure. Uh, we saw our numbers dip um, as um, the outbreak um, started to um, really um, come to, um, you know, to knowledge uh, what was happening overseas um, and then and then as we saw uh, that impact um, our our business started to drop in February um, significantly and then when March hit it was um, you know that was that was massive um, so I was forced uh, to make some really hard decisions um, and um, it's been a it's been an emotional uh, few months. And even while Heather was talking, you know, I'm thinking about like February. You know, we're going into the end of June here. Um, you know, it's almost been five six months that we're that we've been dealing with this, and, and that's just uh, it. It can't be understated. I mean, overstated. Um, how how impactful this has been, and and how long this is going to go for. So. Um, I'm happy to share any parts of our story um, and answer any questions. Um, what we've what we've tried to do to, to 
uh, navigate. I know we we're using the word pivot a lot. I, I tend to lean more uh, on navigate because I feel like we're uh, boats out, out in the out in the ocean during a storm, and um, we don't always have the uh, at every at every moment we're forced to navigate these things that are coming at us faster uh, in real time and sometimes in hyperspeed, um, and we're just. Uh, really trying to make these uh, crucial, crucial decisions that impact so many people um, in, in an instant. And those, it's very, very difficult and very stressful. Um, and there's still so much uncertainty. Um, and uh, but we're, we're trudging on and we're trying to power through and um, really hone in on our core values and what we can do um, to navigate this, uh, this, this storm and really um, how we can, um, you know, go through all of the decision making matrix of first trying to understand what's going on, uh, trying to assess what's going on, trying to assess what our options are, what our best options are, what the best of worst options can be as many of these, those last few months have been um, and, and just make assessments and adjustments. And yeah, so I'll save the rest for the pivot, the pivot part, um, so thank Please. you guys. It's a perfect setup. Thank you, Derek. And before we go too much further, I want to acknowledge Elizabeth, Robert, and Caitlin. We see your questions posted, and we'll be coming back to them at the top of the hour when we open up for Q&A. But we see them, and we haven't missed them. Um, I like the word navigate. It reminds me of the movie with George Clooney, The Perfect Storm. Uh, if you recall, a hurricane off the New England coast, and the fishing boat out of Gloucester, Mass, Andrea Gale, hits a massive 70, 80-foot wave. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at the uh, idea of navigation, our, our question, our first question is one that deals with that. It's, it's what skills and knowledge do you pull on when you navigate? All six of you have successfully navigated um, these conditions, these massive waves that are coming at you from all sides. All six of you have stories to tell from different sectors and areas of the country. Um, so we're going to open it up, and as you uh, come to an idea that you want to share to the panelists, go ahead and speak up. And, and so our question again is: is what, what is it? What's the essence of what you draw upon when you're when you're pivoting or navigating? What is it that you consider? Um, we hope to get from you the essence of what you think of as a life lesson. So what is it that you draw upon? What skills and knowledge do you draw upon to successfully pivot or navigate? Don't be shy, panelist. <laughs> I didn't know if you were going in order. We were gonna okay. Perfect. No, we'll we'll open it up. All right. I mean, I, I think for me it, it's confidence. You know, we and it's confidence that I learned at, at J Wu that um, you know, when you're an eight, 19 year old teaching assistant and they hand you, you know, a dozen 18 year old uh, hospitality students say, Hey, you got an hour, figure it out get lunch out. I'll be in the office and if, you know, don't burn anything, don't hurt anybody. And, you know, at the time I, I know when I first came out of, out of school, I was kind of like, you know, I was in my first career and I'm thinking, I, they didn't teach me this and they didn't teach me that. And, and within a couple of weeks, I started realizing that it was, they were teaching me, you know, you, you can't teach every situation. You can't say, you know, they can teach, Hey, if a fire starts, pull this and run out the back door. Or if an employee gets hurt, you know, file a report, dial 911. But there's a lot of things, especially in our industry, that you have to learn on the fly. And uh, you, you have to have that confidence. Um, you know, I haven't always made the best decisions in business, but I've always had the confidence to take the chance. Um, because from a young age, it was, you know, hey, you learn from your mistake. As long as you don't make that mistake twice. And, and through this process, you know, I didn't know, hey, is this something that's going to sustain us. I mean, I knew this wasn't going to be a career change for us, but it was something that had to sustain us um, and, and keep us moving. Thanks. Very, very insightful. And uh, um, Confidence seems to me to be something that comes from building competency when you feel stronger at your craft over time. Um, and perhaps that competency you've built uh, over time is, is what allows you to shift, John. Uh, other panelists? 
I, I think for, for us, we are, you know, and I, I kind of compare myself to a lot of, you know, restaurant operators who are more freestanding and, and independent, perhaps. Um, like, like, like Derek, for instance, could, you know, he has the ability to sort of shift and navigate towards being a retail, you know, outlet, perhaps, and a part of his restaurant that's very fun and he can tell a story. Um, we had to take a, a step back and I think ask ourselves, what are we, what are we not? And, and at what point do we have to show restraint um, because we don't have that story to tell necessarily? Um, and what parts of our business can we really focus on as opportunities? I think, you know, certainly what I hear a lot in New York City is a lot of restaurateurs are seeing the opportunity to, uh, you know, sort of command the landlord a little bit better in terms of their, um, uh, you know, where it used to be that the landlord, in a, if you're looking to have a restaurant tenant, that was your business. I think now if you're a, a, a landlord, certainly in New York, and you want to have a a restaurant tenant, you need to be willing to become someone who's in the restaurant game a little bit. Um, you know, I think that has certainly shifted. Um, and, and so looking at, you know, the skills that I think when you graduate and, and what you can, you know, sort of take as you look towards the future, being able to understand how the real estate market moves is something that if you're really seriously interested in being a restaurateur or something important, um, you know, we've been able to draw upon those skills, I think, look at opportunities as much as, as much pain as this has caused as well. Mm -hmm. And so, so where, where, where John brings up the confidence, this uh, emotional or, or attitudinal thing, uh, you know, Eric, I think you're, you're bringing up some technical, you know, the, the technical mm -hmm. nature of how we run our businesses, the lease, the finance, the contractual piece. That's very interesting. Things we might not have always had ability to influence. Derek, was that you? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, and you obviously phrased it really well, but, uh, you know, and then going back from the technical, um, even just the primal instincts of, of survival skills, really, as a small business owner, uh, you have, or as a business owner, as a manager, um, but especially as an employer, um, and, and you have responsibilities to people other than yourself. Um, beyond just the responsibilities to our guests and to our, um, you know, whoever we are beholden to. Um, there's so many layers in the hospitality industry, industry right? It can be, you can still be an owner operator and still be beholden to all of the regulatory organizations, to your landlord, to um, your city, your state. Um, there's, there's people to answer to and, um, and, and all of our different uh, vendors and and obligations uh, there. Uh, there's so there's so much responsibility to be had. So I think um, for and I can only speak you know for myself, but um, just sheer um, survival instincts uh, kick in. You you have to prioritize uh, immediately. It's it's again not unlike you know to um, say like as a chef when you're on the line in a busy service and you've got to see the whole field you've got to see the dining room you've got to see the reservations you've got to see what's happening on each cook station you've got to see what's happening uh with your menu with your products you know you're just multi-layering and um trying to make all these critical decisions from the the microest micro decision to the the largest macro uh, you know zoom out that you can and when this happened um that was you know in again just in hyperspeed it was like okay what's going on is you know what do we do um let's just let's just take us take a look here we can't afford like what's going on with uh you know i had two places um we, we i had to make the decision do we, do we try to do takeout? Uh, do we see what's going to happen? Um, and it was just critical thinking and critical decision making one after another, um, trying to pay attention to um, what's happening in, in each unit. Um, and then also trying to stay tethered to um, what's happening, you know, outside of our restaurant in the community, um, whether it be through city, state, um, country, um, all these, you know, advocacy calls that, that we try to participate in. Um, so I think um, critical, critical thinking, uh, adapt adaptability, um, trying to stay as fluid as possible. Um, those are, those are really, really critical skills. 
it sounds like you're making decisions at such a rapid pace. But as you speak, Derek, I think you were talking about survival and it links back with the, the, with the other points that were made, you know, is, is um, uh, we're hearing, you know, confidence and uh, talking about the technical side, but you're linking it with accountability and integrity. You're talking about having to back into your essence in real time, rapid fire and how to make choices in real time. So you grounded them in, the, and I'm paraphrasing, but in accountability and integrity. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really interesting. Um, other panelists want to add on that? Uh, I, Jim, I'd, I'd like to just kind of piggyback on that because as, you know, as we were talking about that concept, in my mind, I was thinking about, um, you know, a, a lot of what our organization has done over the past um, several years is build up um, trust and build up trust and respect with our um, state departments or other organizations that we collaborate with. And, you know, when I think about, th this was a very, very tough and crazy time, but I can't imagine what we would have done if we didn't already have built up an enormous amount of trust and respect and have the positive relationships that mm -hmm we've been working on for the past 30 years. Um, it was, I think, the largest tool in our toolbox that we were able to use during this was um, just to say, okay, we've got, to, we've got to get to someone at the Department of Labor and Training. Who do we know? Who has a relationship there? Who have we talked to about other issues? Let's get on the phone and in most cases, we have cell phone numbers for a lot of these regulators. Um, and, you know, when it comes to same thing with Department of Health and Commerce and uh, Department of Business Regulation. And the reason why they take our phone calls is because we do have that trust and respect with them. And so I think that, you know, I, as a Johnston Whale student, if, you know, if I heard that word networking one more time, it was just, you know, <laughs> drive me insane, right? Um, but it, that's really where those relationships get built. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely a, a skill that will always be useful regardless of whether it's a pre-COVID normal business day or if mm -hmm. it's, you know, a, a major worldwide pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we, Heather, that's so such a uh, really well said, and and I and it really was funny when you said if I heard networking one more time when I was a student, it was like at nauseum, you know, like networking, networking, networking. Uh, but it is true, and I I think only later do you realize that networking is just the the technical piece, but it's relationships, right? It's all about relationships. Trust is part of forming relationships and having relationships with your community, with your peers, with your organizations. Um, and the networking is, you know, is the skill that, that comes from knowing how to form relationships and, and to feed into those relationships. Networking isn't just, you know, it's not one way. It, it's, you know, forming relationships is, is, is putting in more than you're taking out, right. Or trying to at least. And uh, that is, so crucial and so critical and and likewise if had i not had that um you know equity built up and that uh you know and you said it really well like a tool in the tool chest but for me like i i even think of it um you know maybe i think i'm just dramatic but it's like a, a buoy or a lifeline you know like drown i'm drowning and like that's a that's a buoy that's fly, that's going by is that something i know that i can cling to um because it's it's been there because so many years of just trying to build those um, those relationships um, and it was something to center ourselves around um, and it's something that we had when we didn't know what else we we could do was to send those texts out to call to to get on those group calls to get on those group emails and just starting to to find um, some something to, to hold on to and something to do and then just start a build building from there and so many of us uh on the call and so many of us in our industry have been have been doing just that in different ways um mm -hmm. and i think it's incredible um testament to our resilience and to our resourcefulness 
um, to be able to say, okay, I, I need help, but I'm also going to try to help other people while I'm doing this as well. And I think it just speaks volumes about um, what it takes to be um, in this industry. Yeah, I think it's, it's, you're hitting on some themes for, for the independent restaurant operator. And I think Chris, Chris was um, just about to speak a second ago. We'll, we'll bring it back to Chris here too. Um, but Derek, you're hitting another question component as we head towards the end of our mm -hmm. time before Q&A. And that is what's the most important lesson? And you're already answering that. But I want to give Chris a chance to, um, to say a few words. I think, Chris, you were about mm -hmm. to speak and we, um, we, we kept going. <laughs> so, and of course, Mike, uh, we're here too. Yeah, as, as Derek was mentioning, I mean, as in, independent business owners and everything, me being my first experience, this has been a drastic wave I've had to just overcome and kind of take each each wave as it comes uh, towards me. And you always have that sense of drowning, like Derek had mentioned, and um, trying to re reach to the top and gasp for air. And it was, it was coming to the point where we were like, all right, we're getting comfortable now. We've hit our six month mark. We've hit our eight month mark. We've hit our, our uh, 10 month mark. And then comes this huge change. And again, it's trying to adapt and overcome and figure out how we can get through this next, this next situation that we're facing right now. And as soon as you feel like you're, you're getting your goals accomplished and you're ready to kind of phase into your next development, then, you, then you're hit with this, this massive undertaking where it's like, okay, um, what just happened? How do I <laughs> retain my whole staff? Can I retain my, my staff? And then the government mandates that you close down and ship to takeout which is just, it, it, was, it was very difficult and, and trying to figure out where we could go next with this all and just taking, being, being cognizant of all the news that's happening and taking all the safety precautions that we have. I had to heavily, heavily rely on the team that I did have. I mean, we had 22 or 23 employees and I was only able to keep one on board after uh, the government shut us down. And until we could figure out how we were able to work through this, then we started bringing on two employees, three employees, and then we started just asking for more help when we could, when we were able to. And the PPP loan was was a huge um, help or huge assistance with getting things up and operational to be able to go into the next phase of being able to offer outdoor dining seating um, and have more staff come on board. But with all that comes worries of myself and my family because now I'm opening up the restaurant to more guests coming in. Mm -hmm and um, worrying about the staff themselves. I mean, everybody at home has their own concerns about um, how they're going to interact with the guests, how it's going to be like working with uh, masks on for eight, 10 hours a day. And it's just some things that we're trying to be cognizant and aware of and be sensitive to the subject of, of everybody knowing that there's a, a health crisis um, among us and uh, we're all doing the best that we can to keep ourselves safe and the community around. Um, because again, without the community being here for us uh, with all the support that they've shown, we wouldn't have been able to make it past this three month mark. So we have been super uh, supported throughout the whole community and um, just relying heavily on them and trusting in them um, to be able to, to help us sustain, um, not, not so much worry about making a profit, but sustain to be able to keep the business open and operational um, to get us to this point where we are today. Yeah, the risks associated. I did a firsthand run to Boston this past weekend to the seaport, to three different restaurants. Um, uh, and had a chance to see the risks that our people are putting themselves in in engaging consumers. And this weekend we were still open on the patios. We've, we've now opened dining rooms, but it really is not perfect and it is very risky. The c customers were not uh, abiding by proper um, PPE or distancing amongst our employees. So I really recognize that. But what you're hitting too, it, it links Chris with, with what Derek was saying. And, and this is something you said during our training session or our, our review session, it wasn't training session, but our review session, was this idea of integrity, of accountability. You mentioned you had shifted the whole format to a family style. You were looking at really virtually opening a brand new restaurant, but trying to keep the integrity of that farm to table theme that you started with. Um, Derek mentions that when he talks about his, Derek early when I spoke to him in March was worried about his purveyors. This is when his other restaurant was struggling. He's worried about his purveyors. I said, oh my gosh. I hadn't thought of it. Um, so somewhere in this, this integrity accountability thing is an ethos as part of our industry. And it's probably that we're in hospitality, that we look to people around us and have these relational things, as Heather was saying, um, that we worry about relationships, our people, the integrity of our place in the community, our suppliers, um, 
that to me is what makes our industry so special. I only wish there was more federal support when we needed it earlier. Um, and Mike, what do you think? I mean, Mike's a, Mike's a dynamic entrepreneur trying to work across categories. What, what, what was your life lesson, Mike? What was the most important on your end? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, it's very interesting because uh, a lot of what everybody was, was kind of sharing, um, you know, in terms of what skills and how did they carry over. And over the last couple of months, I, I think for us, the, uh, the number one skill that, that is always kind of carried over, which was really interesting in the early days of this, is just being a really good, transparent communicator. Um, and I mean that in a true and honest way. You know, don't communicate a message because you're looking for something else on the backside or whatever it might be. You know, we were all faced with an insanely chaotic situation that nobody in the world, you know, has really ever faced before. Um, and, you know, to me, I thought the simplest way to overcome some of that is, you know, really just being that great communicator, being very transparent, being very upfront. You know, everybody's time is so critical right now. We're all trying to figure out so many things so fast um, that it was important to not only communicate the, the message, but communicate it the first time the right way. Um, and you know, very early on, we, we kind of recognized this happening. I happened to be out in California, um, was really kind of watching what's going on in a global scene because we do bring certain commodities and different things in from around the world. Um, and as we started to notice this outbreak and, you know, once I started to see, uh, you know, parts of Asia really in the early days starting to close down, you know, we basically had some internal calls and said, okay, like the reality of the situation is if it's happening there, it's going to continue to happen. We're in a far more connected global supply chain than we were 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, you couldn't really fly around the world even as simple as you can today. It's all gotten very, very fast. Um, and it created this dynamic situation where in the beginning, we tried to be very transparent. We tried to be that great communicator. And we we're going to schools and we're saying, look, Asia's shut, Europe's shutting. Don't be in the camp that you think you're not going to need some kind of emergency relief because at that point, we had already been planning. You know, we had already started to buy huge amounts of juice boxes and graham crackers and, you know, all sorts of various raw materials. And it's not that we had orders against it. It was really just looking at the data points of, you know, this is all going on. And as we tried to be transparent with the network, you know, the network's pushing back and, and they're saying, you know, well, you know, we don't think it's going to be that bad or we don't think it could be this extreme, and, you know, all these different things. And, you know, they weren't wrong. I mean, right. They were pushing back against a theory of there's no way American schools are going to close period. End of story. It's never happened on that, let alone the scale we're seeing. Um, so for us, we had to be that great communicator, not only internally to our suppliers to be able to buy what we're buying or even in the middle, you know, really the thick of the pandemic, get the goods that we needed, right? You can't just call somebody and say, hey, I want to buy 5 million juice boxes and get, you know, two truckloads a day every single day for the next 90 days straight. They're not sitting on that inventory either. So it created this massive ripple effect through the entire supply chain, especially for us, because we need goods that are very specific. I need a juice box that's 4.23 ounces to meet a USDA regulation. I can't give you four. And if I give you four and a half, they're going to yell at me because I'm giving you an extra two grams of sugar. So we have to work really close with our supply chain, be really transparent, be great communicators, you know, stick to what we believed in. And most importantly, our goal, even when we were founded, was to create great products and help feed the millions of students in this country that go hungry on a day-to-day -day basis because we're in food service, we've been able to expand into other areas of food service, but that's our real goal. Um, and with everything going on, we really sat back and said, you know, we want to be a leader. We know this is happening. There's no way it's not gonna happen and we need to do something to change it. Um, so it's definitely been a really chaotic couple of months, but I, I really do. I think the most important thing that we learned through it is those that communicate precisely in the most transparent way and honest way will for us it worked with our customers wanting to come to us when they did have the need it worked for us with our suppliers that you know we needed to buy more and they're saying okay great you know we're going to allocate it to you versus the guys that are calling them and they're all over the place i need this no change it i need this i need that i need this you know we really tried to to address all of those things and and smooth things um out as much as possible because we needed to actually do the opposite. We needed to not just limit, we needed to drastically scale up programs, um, thousands of percent, you know, 
turning loading docks that are up a thousand percent and you have 20 docks and it's full 24 seven and it's not stopping and filling the aisles with pallets. So it was really uh, really pretty chaotic challenge, but uh, very fortunate that, you know, we have a great supply network and, and I, I really do think the food service industry as a whole has really risen to the occasion um, to help support what we're all faced with. That's fantastic. And I'll do a quick uh, summary. We're going to transition to our Q questions. And we do have uh, six or seven of them now. And I see Dan, John, and Roberts posted a few questions. I want to leave it open for Liza to start us out with a question. But just to recap really fast, you know, we, we just, you know, Mike, you, you're talking about confidence and communication. And back to Derek's metaphor, I think of this boat out to sea, the perfect storm. And I'm hearing about needing confidence, which, which John started us with. And, and this attitudinal piece, um, uh, going to, to Eric talking about the technical and you know, just things we wouldn't have normally thought about, the real estate piece and ad addressing some of these fixed costs that we deal with. Um, accountability and integrity in the broader theme, Derek sharing you know, uh, uh, this notion of relationships um, that, that Heather has, has laid before us and how critical having a cell phone number even um, you know, those things together speaking to the broader uh, competencies or considerations we all need, no matter what the situation is, when the water starts to get rough. Um, you know, Chris talking about his constant reflection and re-establishing a new vision for his restaurant. So being able to react and then create a new vision, um, which shifts your mission. Um, amazing stuff, panelists. It's just absolutely amazing. And, and as we were wrapping, um, Mike, I, I have this vision of you on your boat yelling to your deckhands while taking a strong call back to shore and trying to find a path through the storm that leads to opportunity. You know, survival was a word that you mentioned. I do. Uh, but, I think it's important for, uh, for those people to really grab two hands on the wheel um, yeah. and, and be really committed. You know, it's, it's, I think it's very important for that. I think it shows good leadership to the rest of the team. Um, especially in a time of crisis when you know, everybody's got a lot of anxieties amongst personal, work, professional, corporate, and everything in between. Um, I think it's really important for that person who's the communicator to, to really put both hands on the wheel. Um, and for us, I mean, I know our team was sleeping at the office, but we had people doing all sorts of really crazy things. Um, and it's not that we asked them to put themselves in that position. They, they wanted to. Um, and I, and I think it's because, you know, of that communication and, and really that great corporate mission of wanting to do something bigger than, you know, yourself collectively. Yeah, it's a deep intrinsic motivation. I'm going to wrap us up here with just one quick story. As I just said before, I've known Derek a long time. And because we're in Rhode Island, um, we have a chance to speak more. And I also want to recognize our alumni from Miami, from Denver. I spent a lot of time and I also helped open the Miami campus and our brothers and sisters from the Charlotte campus. Um, when I refer to home base as Providence, it's never that I forget all of the rest of you. And having been part of Miami and Denver in particular, I just want to acknowledge all the alums from the other campuses. We consider everybody as part of the JNW family to be family. Um, but I will talk about Derek for a second. And when Derek and I were speaking in March into April, Derek posted the GoFundMe campaign prior to there being any sort of federal anything. And I remember it being an existential thing as a leader for Derek to even have to ask but the most beautiful thing I've seen, and it's an example I've used repeatedly, was when the community in Rhode Island assured Derek's continuation by rallying behind that GoFundMe. Um, it was a vote of confidence in an iconic restaurant in our community that the community decided had to remain. And so when I think of j and and who we are, our alumni, and the way we operate in our communities, all, all of you, all six of you, it's that vote of confidence and relationships that step forward at times like this to say, we're more than just a local place to eat or a local community organization or a school food service provider, that we're part of something bigger. And when the community steps in to acknowledge that, um, it's heartwarming. And I think, you know, Derek and I were talking about it. So I'm sorry, Derek, if I share that, but I know it wasn't easy for you. And I just, I have so much respect for the community and for you, Derek, for what happened there. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, so we can open up to questions, uh, but let's start with Liza, uh, and then we'll go through a few here. We're going to try and stay on time. I hate to have to end us, but I don't want to go too far over. 
Sure. So, John, our first question is for you from Elizabeth. She is wondering, are you starting to have small outdoor weddings and offering smaller wedding packages? Yes. Uh, so we last this past weekend, so I'm in Pennsylvania, our restrictions have been uh, pretty, pretty rough. Uh, we were only allowed to have up to, groups up to 25 up until uh, this week. Actually, Friday, we go into what they're calling the green phase, and we can host events over 25 people. So we had two weddings last week, but in the green phase, we also couldn't staff the, the weddings, so they were drop-off. Um, so like Derek was saying, like, you know, that word pivot, everything is getting overused. Well, now we're getting this micro wedding and, you know, I'm getting, you know, three or four emails a day, which is, listen, it's great that people want to use us and they, they want to give you business. Um, but a lot of these people are also still planning the, the large event next year. And, and what we've struggled with is, you know, if we've sold the event already and we've spent the time to sell the the twenty-five or thirty thousand dollar wedding, and now they want to turn it into a thousand dollar wedding. You know, personally, I'd rather wait till next year and, and get the full amount. We've already done the work to get that client, um, and I don't want to leave that kind of money on the table. I also don't want to be greedy or stupid. You know, you, you learn from the past, and you know that's one thing that I would say that I've gotten out of all this is you know, when I started my business, we had nine eleven, and then we had. Uh, the economic downturn in 2009. And, and, you know, you sometimes you forget the past. You start focusing and get hyper-focused on, we're only going to concentrate on doing this. And then you get hit with something like this where you have to be able to, to pivot. So we have been taking them. Maybe they're not making us a ton of money, but it's starting to, it's a good getting our staff back into the workforce, starting to bring people back off of unemployment and starting to get them uh, transition. Or, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we are seeing a lot of them. Great. Thanks, John. Um, Heather, I'm going to direct this next one to you to start. So Caitlin said, very intrigued to hear about the alcohol regulations. It's such a huge revenue source for hospitality and it's shifted so dramatically to at-home consumption. How do you feel about this impact? Well, as far as the at-home consumption, I certainly saw that firsthand when I went to my local liquor store and there are now gigantic shopping carts that people are using instead of just grabbing a quick, you know, six pack and heading up to the counter. There's, you know, a lot of overfilled shopping carts. But from, the, from an industry standpoint, um, one of the things, and, and this just kind of piggybacks on what I was saying earlier about um, having relationships and building relationships that every, every state is going to be different on their regulations. And then in that state, additional city or town are, you know, local municipality regulations. So I can only speak on behalf of, you know, the state of Rhode Island in the sense that we have our Rhode Island Department of Business regulation that, you know, after the bills are passed, they're the, the regulatory authority. However, in Rhode Island, city um, or liquor licenses um, are obtained through your local city or town municipality. And so there was a discrepancy, um, you know, kind of between can restaurants do takeout sales um, at the state level, do takeout sales. Um, and then at the local city or town level, there were some that wanted to go ahead and allow liquor licenses to do it and others that didn't. Um, and so when you talk about like building relationships, the good news for us was that we have legal counsel on staff full time and we were able to um, help write the new regulations so that um, our so that our industry was able to move forward with we started out with just beer and wine um but we basically said okay here here are the new regulations that we wrote them and said this is how you can make this happen um and it was definitely a collaborative effort among many many agencies um but we got that passed and then we so we started with beer and wine and then we uh worked towards uh spirits and we were able to to get some of that taken care of i think that you know we what was happening is many many of our food service establishments and hotels i mean 
they're sitting on tens of thousands of dollars worth of alcohol inventory. And they're going to lose that inventory at, at some point. And so when I talk about advocacy, this was our way of educating those regulars to say, um, you know, in, in not so small terms, but, you know, come on, throw us a bone here. Give, it, give us another opportunity. Because right now that inventory is not being sold. It's not going back to the wholesaler, the distributor. It's not going to the liquor stores. And if you don't, if we're not able to sell it, you are losing out on sales tax and meals and beverage tax revenue that is coming into the state. Um, I mean, we, you know, we track those numbers from the Department of Revenue every single month. And I can tell you that in 2019, the total of 2019, over $236 million in tax revenue came directly from meals and beverage and sales tax just in the food service industry. And so we were able to kind of use some of those statistics to kind of just, um, you know, state our case a little bit more. Mm -hmm. We, um, once this pandemic kind of comes to a close, um, as of right now, the way the Rhode Island laws are written, uh, alcohol to go is not able to continue under current law, current regulation. That is something that's on the top of our agenda when the General Assembly does go back into session. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something we're, we're gonna push for to see if we could possibly uh, keep that opportunity there moving mm -hmm. forward. I think we have time for one more question and back to Liza and thank you, Heather. You have no idea how big that decision was, especially for we consumers when I can call Derek and get a takeout meal and a bottle of rosé, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so. Uh, Liza, do we have time? One we have more, Liza. One more question. I'm going to kind of combine two questions into one. They're from Robert and Dan. So the questions are, do you see policies adjusting to a new normal as opposed to temporary adjustments? And rolling into that question from Dan, given the impact COVID, COVID has had on the food industry in total, how would you encourage students towards a career in the industry? Wow. I, th I think um, that's that's a big one. That's tough. Um, uh, I think we're going to see a lot of these pieces uh, stay for a long time, whether they're um, going to be um, permanent. Uh, they're going to have some permanency that goes beyond um, when the restrictions lift, um, because I don't. This isn't going to be something that just immediately flips back to whatever normal uh, normal is. Uh, this is something that's going to um, take a long time to untangle and some things may never go back to pre-COVID, uh, whether they be regulations or consumer behaviors or uh, restaurant and operational procedures. Uh, what this has done more than anything uh, beyond the imminent health uh, risks and, and, um, and and from a medical and health standpoint is it's exposed the fragility of our of our um, food system um, more so than those of us that have been working on those issues for for years and years uh, it's just brought it to the forefront and and forced it to trickle down into everybody's life um, you know when people can get food when people uh, when unemployment numbers soared um, and all those of us from operational standpoints, and I'm sure, you know, Michael and, and the larger uh, purchasers can uh, attest to this when um, uh, the foodways, food sources, distribution channels, everything just impacted at such a massive level. And uh, we still haven't began to see uh, the long terms or even the short term uh, medium, you know, terms like a uh, few months out, um, uh, effects of that this is going to have. So I think you're going to see a lot of regulatory pieces stay and, and they're going to keep coming. The, the, the changes are going to keep coming. They're going to have to because um, this is completely new. Um, there's no data. Um, you know, there's things that have happened 
Um, as John was saying, you know, those of us that have been around, we went through 9-11, we went through a couple economic crashes, we've gone through either a very pinpoint health crisis, um, food outbreaks um, that were pinpoint and, and far outreaching, but nothing that has touched everything everywhere like this on both the economic, socioeconomic, health, uh, regulatory, operational, distribution, um, it's and now even reaching out into again making connections with environmental impact uh this is massive it's going to go for a long time um so buckle in um yeah and and that's really what i would tell anybody who's thinking about jumping into it and and honestly um i think for the anyone you know some people uh it'll it'll be like you're when you have a student or the first time you walk into a kitchen you're either really excited or you're like, no way, like this is not for me, right? And I think that's going to be the same thing uh, for for a lot of people. They're either going to be, you know, they're going to feel the adrenaline rush on the opportunity um, for impact, for outreach, for, um, you know, social uh, justice, for um, helping those uh, food insecurity. Uh, there's, those opportunities have only escalated. So I think there will be a lot of opportunities for um, the right types of students to really dig in and do some meaningful and impactful work. Um, but it's going to be, it's not going to be easy. It wasn't easy before and now it's going to be even harder. Yeah, I think they're just going to be, the opportunities are going to be different. You know, I don't, the reality is there's not less people, right? You know, there's still more people. The population is going to continue to grow both domestically and globally. Um, you know, so obviously people aren't going to eat less. They're not going to stop eating. You know, these things aren't going to change. It's how they eat, where they eat, what they want, how they order, how they get it. You know, all of these things are going to change. And then for somebody like me on the backside, it's how am I going to produce it? What am I going to do differently? How do I ship it differently? How do I handle it? Um, so I don't, you know, I think the food industry, you know, encouraging students towards a career in the industry, I think the industry as a whole is going to just continue to explode, you know, between needing new food safety people, between needing more training, between needing all of these new things to meet what this new world is going to look like for us. I think that's going to be a huge explosion. Maybe from a direct chef in a kitchen standpoint, yeah, that's absolutely, you're going to have more of a challenge there. Um, but especially, you know, younger students or people really looking to, to get involved in the food industry. I think it's a fantastic time because there's all this new stuff that's transpiring from new regulations, which needs new people to learn it, new people to implement it, new people to manage it, new businesses to start it and run it. Um, and that demand is just going to be, I mean, it's going to be massive. It's going to be every restaurant, every hospitality, every hotel, every, you know, everything. Um, so I think as a whole, the industry is, is just going to boom. It's just, it's going to shift and it's going to shift. I mean, it's shifting now, you know, instantly in front of us. I'll pick it up there and thank you all. The, uh, it, it, just to touch on this question really fast is, you know, for me, and I have a son going out the door in the fall to, to his freshman and first year in college. Um, you know, to me, a great education, like one at Johnson & Wales, it provides the um, habits of mind, the character, and the technical expertise to do well and no matter what you choose. We happen to go through the door of hospitality and food service in particular as we enter our careers, but as you all have said, we're all capable of doing so much more having gone through that door. Um, you are the case study for those doing the very best in the industry still, but we have hundreds of alumni, thousands of alumni who have broadened their career path to many others. So I think as people ask me what's gonna happen at Johnson & Wales, we're not quite sure either. So please, as alumni, keep an eye on us. And if we need your help someday in the future, be there. Um, but I think we're gonna do fine. I think that the industry is gonna return. And I encourage my son and anyone else his age to look at our industry long-term. And then I remind them, by the way, September of 2020 is the perfect time to not be working somewhere, but to be in college. It's not the best time to have to pay for it, but it's a great time to go to college. And uh, you know, Jane W is in the dream business. Mo Gaby, that was one of the things he used to tell us as we started as young faculty. And I still think that's the case. Johnson & Wales are in the business of helping the students live their dream, be who they want to be as people to make society better and to also assure that we're facilitating that 
pursuit of what you dream to be. Um, and so I just want to stop there and, you know, thank you as a panel, as alumni, I want to also say that you, you folks, when you share the way you do, you help bring out the best in us as an institution. Um, you probably don't recognize it, but every time you speak with us and share the way you're doing, you share life lessons and you remind us of how to be better at what we do. And when you do that, we take it back in the classroom. We don't live every day on the front line the way you do, but we watch you and we bring back from you the lessons that you're learning and paying dues to learn. And so I just want to say as a teacher, uh, thank you. And I'll hand it back to Ms. Lori Zabata and she can take us home. Thank you, uh, Dr. Griffin and our panelists for such an informative and interesting discussion about the impact of COVID-19 on the hospitality industry. We're grateful to all of you for sharing your time with us today and appreciate your insight on this topic. In such an unprecedented time, it's impressive to hear how you were all able to find your way through some dark days and wish you much success in the days and months ahead. And thank you to all of our alumni attendees today as well. We know the past few months haven't been easy, but hopefully you found today's session informative and helpful. We've all felt the effects of the pandemic and Johnson & Wales is no exception. The university was able to limit the disruption to students by quickly pivoting to remote learning, but many students continue to experience unforeseen challenges affecting their ability to complete their degrees and pursue their goals. And like so many others, JWU families are facing financial hardships, which threaten students' ability to continue their studies at JWU. That's why we've established the JWU Emergency Fund to provide direct and immediate assistance to our Wildcats. If you're in a position to give back today, please consider making a gift of any amount using the link in the chat window. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed today's session, Pivoting During COVID-19, How JWU Alumni in the Hospitality Industry Adjusted, which was part of the JWU Connects family of programming. Through JWU Connects, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to professional development topics, as well as opportunities for networking and connection with fellow classmates and faculty. For the full listing of upcoming events, including tonight's Cook with JWU demo and Thursday's Sip with JWU virtual Chardonnay tasting, please visit our events calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. We greatly appreciate your time today and wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you to our panel, John, Heather, Mike, Chris, Derek, Eric, thank you so much for your time. Jim, appreciate all that you do to support our initiatives in alumni relations and um, to the alumni relations team, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day.